so we was going to talk a little bit about Islam in the 20th century, right? So we're now we're in the 21st century. So what was happening with the Muslims in America in the 20th century? And there's a there's a a group or there's an institute that was known as or I'm sorry, an organization that was known as Adin Allahi Universal Arabic Association. And they was formed in the 30s. And they was on the East Coast. And they were started by a man who I always say, you ever heard people say such and such was Steph Curry before Steph Curry. So James Lomax Bay was Malcolm X before Malcolm X. Right. Like if you look at the trajectory of their lives, you'll see a lot of similarities. Right. And we this is something that's. You see throughout history, and when you see historical figures, a lot of times one figure will mirror, like the situations won't exactly line up, but a lot of the, the context will see a lot of similarities in both of their people's lives. So whenever you talk about Islam in the 20th century, you want to start out with Islam in the 19th century. So in the 19th century, there was a man named Edward Wilmot Blyden, and he was born in the U.S. Virgin Islands. And he was born during the time of slavery, even though he was born to a free family. And he was a, he was trained by a Christian minister. And so back in those days, unlike today, when somebody was a religious figure, he had to know a lot of different languages. So a lot of the training. So if he was a Christian clergyman, you would know Hebrew and Greek because you'd be expected to learn that. So this guy, he learned Hebrew. He learned Greek at an early age. He came to the United States. They tried to put him in a seminary, but because he was black and this was the United States in the 1800s, he was denied entry. So at the urging of some of his backers, they said, man, you should go to Africa. They have this place called Sierra Leone and they have another place called Liberia. And if you go there, you know, you can be an asset. And so he did. He went to Africa and he went to Sierra Leone and he became what became known as the father. He became known as the father of Pan-Africanism. So Pan-Africanism or black nationalism is something that developed as a result of the end of slavery. What, what you know, slavery and you have colonialism in Africa so people stood, mainly him he developed an idea called the African personality so there's certain things that all Africans share certain personality traits positive ones you know and so for the African personality he had a theory he said well which what religion best suits the African personality. So he wrote a book and the book was called Christianity, Islam, and the Negro Race. It's a book written by Edward Wilmot Blyden. There's about three to four hundred pages. You can still buy it today. It's still in print. And this book was an argument in which he said, Edward Wilmot Biden, who was a Christian minister, says, why don't you go sit down? <laughs> Edward Wilmot Biden, who was a Christian minister, he said that the religion for the African personality was Islam. And so he talked about 
what Islam's done for Africans, how Africans who practice Islam, they had their own independent. Now, we don't exactly have clergy, man. But we have ulama. So he said, like, in, in, in Catholicism, which is the biggest Christian group, at the time he wrote this, there had never been an African bishop. And all of the Catholic Africans depended on European Catholics. But he said, African Muslims, they have their own scholars. And they have their own religious movements. And they're independent. It's like they, they don't need like a, a guy behind them. You know, and we know this Islam, you know, everybody's responsible to Allah for their own rectification. If somebody can't practice Islam for me, I can't practice Islam for my kids. Right? So the religion is itself, and this is what he was saying. He was saying the religion, so he writes a book, which now nobody really has heard of, but at the time was very popular. And it was called Christianity, Islam, and the Negro Race. And because of this book, many people who were like educated black Americans, they started to believe that Islam was their religion. Even though they have never met a Muslim, you growing up in South Carolina or Georgia or Texas, you don't run into Muslims in 1910. Sometimes you might not run into Muslims in some of those places in 2010. <laughs> so this is the beginning of the 20th century and you have a Christian scholar writing an argument that the religion for black people is Islam and that had a very very positive effect when you went into the 20th century because he's known as the father of Pan-Africanism, which means Marcus Garvey studied his works. Uh, I mean, any of those, you know, Kwame Nkrumah, people be like, I don't know who these people are, but they're very important people. <laughs> Historically speaking, they was important figures. But they all studied the works of Edward Wilmot Blyden, and this caused Islam to become kind of like, you know, most blacks, Americans was definitely Christian. Throughout history, the only religion outside of Christianity to have any significant population amongst black folks is Islam. You would be like, why did this happen? Did it just come out of nowhere? No. You had a scholars. He wasn't the only one, but he, he he was one of the most prominent ones because he became the head of the schools in Sierra Leone. And he also became their ambassador to France. So it's not like, you know, Sundiata could write a book. People are like, so what? But if somebody's like, he's an ambassador and he's writing stuff, people are like, oh, okay, maybe I should be Muslim. So you had people with this longing for the religion of Islam, even though there wasn't any translations of the Quran in the English in the early 20th century. There was no prayer books. So how did people start practicing Oddly enough, they had this minority group in the subcontinent called the Ahmadiyya. And so before Donald Trump in America, when people were persecuted, they could get asylum 
and be let into the so you can prove I'm being persecuted for my religion you get asylum and then you come to America and then they make you live in like the ghetto but after Donald Trump they say I right, just leave him in a cage at the border <laughs> But so at this time in the 1920s, you had these Ahmadiyya Muslims in the south subcontinent, and they were saying, we're being persecuted because we believe that there's a prophet after the prophet Muhammad. And there was two groups. One was the Qadianis, and the other is the Ahmadiyya. So, you know, one group is still considered in the fold of Islam by the majority of scholars because they, they, you know, it's like how close do you get to blasphemy? So they say, well, Ghulam Ahmed, he was a Mujeddid. And since they say that, they say, he, that you came all the way up to the blasphemy line and stopped. So you, you still in. And then other people say, the other ones, the Kadiani, they said, no, 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 he's a messenger of God. So they, they passed the, the blasphemy line. We have one imam, he give kudbahs, I'll be like, he, he taking you all the way up to the line, but then he going to walk you back by the, by the, <laughs> by the second kudbah. You come all and you be like, man, this is some blasphemous stuff. <laughs> and so that was the difference so the Ahmadiyya they ended up coming in big numbers and because they were they had melanin which means they were brown couldn't exactly go live in Park Heights so they ended up living next to black folks in what they call the Ohio River Valley and so Ahmadiyya missionaries, anybody know who this man is? Marcus Garvey. Marcus Mosiah Garvey. He had one of the biggest African-American movements in the history of America. They shut him down and put him in prison for mail fraud. Because they said some kind of way when he was getting donations, whatever he said the donations was for, he might have used the money for something else. But they was, you know, they was getting penny donations. He was working in the, you know, the, the 8, 19, 10 and stuff. It wasn't like nobody was donating $100. They was getting donations of 25 cents here. They got so many donations. He was saying, up you mighty race. He was saying, get ready for that black train that's coming. So we got to give up on America and we got to go back to Africa. And one of his main teachers was named Deuce, Deuce Muhammad Ali. And Duse Muhammad Ali, some people say, he used to say he was a Sudanese Egyptian. I ain't never met no Egyptian who said that. Like, you either from Sudan or, or, or Miss, you ain't both, right? <laughs> but chances are, he was like so many other black people, just somebody searching for an identity. Are people calling you a Negro? Are they calling you colored? He was like, you know, we didn't call ourselves black. Like that, to, back in those days, you would never, a black person would never call themselves black. But then what do we call ourselves? So different people would come with different things. So, you know, Deuce Muhammad Ali, he probably read Christianity, Islam, and the Negro race. He said, I'm Muslim. And this guy, he traveled all over the Western world. He was, he was in London. He was an actor. 
big actor in London. Then he came to the to the U.S. to Detroit. He helped with different massages, but he didn't speak Arabic. So the, you know, you have pictures of him, the most melanated guy. He like in Detroit in them days. There, all of the Arabs was from Syria. So you put one black dude with a bunch of Syrians, he stand out. So you got pictures of him with like a like a tartarbouche and like a suit on. And all these Syrians, they loved him to death. But they was like, he don't speak Arabic, though. (laughs) You know, Arabic and Islam, that's like a language of privilege. Like, if you speak Arabic, you can go a long way. You don't speak Arabic, you can only give kutbahs in Oakland. They'd be like... (laughs) So, he was one of the teachers, and he helped find the paper for Marcus Garvey. And so he actually would see these Ahmadiyyas and he would invite them to to Marcus Garvey's meetings. They would come to the meetings and recruit people to the religion of Islam, their understanding of it. You know what I'm saying? Like, do we agree 100% with the Ahmadiyya understanding? No. But they was teaching people how to pray. They was telling people how to pay zakat. They was t- teaching people how to make wudu. They was telling people don't eat pork. So a lot of the things that they was doing, you know, they was bringing people from Christianity. You know, it's one thing if you, somebody's Muslim, and then you tell them Gulam Ahmed's a prophet. But if somebody Christian and you tell them Gulam Ahmed's a prophet, that's like a zero-sum game. Because at least now, he don't believe Jesus is God no more. Know what I'm saying? And but for us, a lot of times as Muslims, we didn't we don't even talk about the history. We get, you can't talk about Islam in America without talking about the Ahmadiyya. You can. Because they had uh, this guy right here, Mufti Muhammad Sadiq. He's an Amer- He's a one of the first Islamic scholars to come to the United States uh, after slavery. Like during slavery, there's a lot of Islamic scholars who came here, but they were slaves, so they weren't able to like open up masjids. But this guy, he worked with the Syrian community until they found out he was flipping people. The Syrians, he helped open up some of the first masses in Detroit, the first mass in Detroit. But then he had he was going to people like, yeah, you got to say Gulam Ahmed. So they was like, OK, you can't come around here no more. But he <laughs> he was a scholar. So he was teaching African-Americans the Arabic language. He was teaching African-Americans like there's an African-American who was a student of his, who later he became Sunni Muslim. He made Hajj in 1957, which is like, I don't know, eight years before Malcolm X. But the difference is when he went on Hajj, he already knew how to pray. This guy, his name is... His name was Imam Wali Akram. And he became Muslim because he ran into some Ahmadiyya when he was in college. Black Ahmadiyya. And once he became a part of the Ahmadiyya movement, you know, he was very intelligent. He was like a genius. This guy, when he died, he had like 75 electrical patents. Electrical engineering patents. Patents. Like when he was, he was, he made one of the first machine guns. He has a patent, a patent for the first, one of the first machine guns in the history of the world. His name was Wally Akram. I don't know what's going on with that. <laughs> but Wally Akram. He goes to Cleveland, Ohio, and when he's in Cleveland, he opens up a masjid, 
right? It's called First Mosque, Cleveland. He opened it up originally in 1927. But then he reopened it in 1932 when he became a Sunni Muslim. But he studied Arabic with Mufti Muhammad Sadiq and he wrote a book that when I was a kid, you know, some books was in everybody's house. You would go to every, you'd be like, this guy's Muslim, he got this book on the, on the shelf, right? So the book that he had, that he wrote, that anybody who's my age and up, they probably didn't even know who he was. They was like, wait a minute, I didn't know this guy was... I didn't know this guy was uh okay. <laughs> I didn't know this guy was um black. He wrote a book called Arabic Made Easy. Anybody remember that book? Who remember that book? Only the old folks. <laughs> he writes a book called Arabic Made Easy. And he put his kunya on it, Abu something, Abu, I don't remember, Abu Ahmed, something like that. So people see this book, they didn't know it was written by some dude that was born in Texas, born on a, born on a plantation. So as, as Muslims, we got to ask ourselves, how is it that a person can be born on a plantation? In a town where if he caught out the sundown, he's going to get lynched. They call these places sundown towns. They still have them in America. You get caught out here at the sundown, boy. It ain't going to. And so this is was all of the towns in the south. Like y'all got to be in like the zombies is coming. They had a movie one time with Will Smith called I Am Legend. And when the sun would go down, he had to be locked up in the house. That's what it meant. That, that was what it meant to be black in like 1920. You go to the wrong neighborhood after sundown, you're not going to make it out alive. So people like this, they end up writing books called Arabic made easy. And as Muslims, this is a miracle because there's no way humanly possible that that could happen. There's no way that a man could be born on a plantation in 1880 and become an Islamic scholar. So this here, this is one of the first mosques built from the ground up. It's in Chicago. They was Ahmadiyya's. This is a picture of some Ahmadiyya Muslims. You know what I'm saying? I'm glad it came back on. I was stalling for time. Talking about Will Smith. <laughs> You know, so they had this thing called the Black Arts Movement in, you know, you know, Harlem Renaissance. And one time, all of these black folks just started writing books, you know, composing music. And Islam was a major part of that because a lot of those people, they looked at themselves as being Muslim. They might not have known all of the ins and outs. But they was like, Allah is God. And this is like 1920s. They would tell their family, I ain't eating pork no more. This is when everybody ate pork. Like the, the staple food for the diet was the pig out of necessity. Because if you cook a pig, that thing going to last all winter. Anything, ain't nothing else that you could grill and still be eating that thing months later. So when people was poor, 
They would grill. They would put this big pig on the grill and grill it. They didn't have freezers to freeze the meat. So they found out this. You could do a lot. So everything Christian, you should tell that black Christians come from African Muslims. Because everything black Christians do with the pig, Muslims do with lamb. I remember one time somebody gave me some meat. They say, man, go get this out in the community. I said, I, I, I could just give it out to non-Muslims. It's cool. He said, give it out to whoever. So I roll up on East Oakland. I see some people. I say, hey, man, I got some meat for y'all. It's fresh. Just came from the farm. They say, oh, what kind of meat is it? I said, lamb. They said, oh, man, we don't know nothing about no lamb. I said, man, it's just like pork. I said, just like you got lamb chops, you got pork chops. You got lamb roast, you got pork roasts. You got lamb chitlins, you got pork chitlins. You got hog head cheese. You got lamb brains, the same stuff. It was like, you know, we don't, we just didn't have access to lamb like that. So there was a man, and this is gets a little bit to the crux of the matter. His name was T Timothy Drew. And in 1913, he formed the Canaanite Temple, which is deep, because the Canaanites are the Palestinians. So he was like, this right here is a temple for Canaanites, not no Hebrews. You know, like, you know, I mean, y'all, uh, Ali Atai comes here all the time, so y'all know more about the Canaanites than me. But just historically, for him to make it the Canaanite temple, and he was like, and we Muslims. He first opened it in Newark, New Jersey. But then he didn't get a lot of play, so he moved to Chicago. And when he got to Chicago, it bloomed into a, it, he, it, he changed the name to the Moore Science Temple, but it bloomed into this giant organization. It grew so fast amongst black people, so everybody wanted to be Muslim. So he was like, okay, you're going to be Muslim, you got to, if you're a man, you got to pay $2 a month and you're Muslim. And if you're a woman, you pay $1 a month, and you Muslim. And this before, you know, we grew up with all these English translations of the Quran. There were no English translations of the Quran at that time, like the ones that we know. There were some old ones that was translated by, like, white British guys, and it was very, very horrible translations. But like the stuff that we, Yusef Ali, Marmaduke, Pictal, that stuff all came out in the 30s. He preceded that. And he didn't know Arabic. He was a circus performer. He was like, ran in, you know, when you were in the circus, you traveled the world. He ran into some Muslims. So I like these guys, man. I'm Muslim just like y'all. So he writes out a book. He says, he calls it the seven circle Quran. And then in the footnote, it said, not to be confused with the Quran of the Prophet Muhammad. And it just was like basic teachings, you know, stuff he probably got from the Bible, stuff he got from other little New Age religions. You know, $2 a month, $1 a month. They was bringing in $18,000 a month. That's how big the organization was. This organization preceded the nation of Islam. Every one of the terms that you heard in the nation of Islam actually started in the, in the Moore Science Temple. They used to have a member of the Moore Science Temple, whose name was David Ford. 
And he changed his name. He started the nation of men. But when we talk about Islam in America, most people start out with the nation of Islam. They don't start out with the Ahmadiyyas. They don't start out with Noble Jurali. They don't start out with Edward Wilmot Blyden. They don't start. They just go straight to the nation. And, and it's, you know, it's because so many people came from the nation and, you know, they wanted to present Islam. There would be no Islam in America without the nation. That's what they wanted to present. But historically, it's not accurate. Right. So this is a picture of them in 1928. Right. And. Like I said, he wrote the seven circle Quran, but there's a there's three people in the front. There's this guy, Noble Jurali. And then there's Ava Brewster, Brister. And then there's James Lomax Bay. So James Lomax Bay was Noble Drew Ali's second in command, right? That's why I said he's Malcolm X before Malcolm X. The difference was I feel like when Noble Drew Ali would use terms like prophet, it was like how Christians said prophet. Like a Christian you go to school or something, you study a little Bible, you're going to be like, I'm a prophet. I'm the apostle. For Muslims, we like, blasphemy. <laughs> but he, he came from a Christian background, so he was like, I'm the leader of this group. I'm the prophet. But he never claimed he met God or anything like that, right? But not to say he's totally 100% innocent or his Aikido was straight, but a lot of the things, there's a lot of the things that we practice as American Muslims came from Mufti Muhammad Sadiq. Mufti Muhammad Sadiq is the first person to say if you in America, you got to follow the laws. He's the first person to say that because when he tried to enter to the country, he was put in detention. They said, he said, man, why you put me in detention? I got asylum. All of you let everybody else. They said, nah, man, you a scholar. You come up in here, you're going to try to take a second wife. He said, no, as a Muslim, how many, we all heard this, right? Muslims, any, they going to say, you got to follow the laws of the country. Sisters, I know all the sisters know that one. <laughs> that came from Mufti Muhammad Sadiq. Like, you can look it up. I'm not inventing it. I'm not saying it's not valid. I'm not saying go break some laws. But I'm saying... <laughs> The second thing I said that to say, Noble Drew Ali, the first person on record to claim that Buddha was a prophet in the history of the world is Noble Drew Ali. In his seventh circle Quran, he said, I follow all the prophets from Adam to Noah to Abraham, to Jesus, to Muhammad, and Buddha. So when I was young, I was like, yeah, Buddha was a prophet. I tried to tell some Buddhists that. They said, man, get up out of here with that. I said, nah, man, you know, he was just, you know how, like, Jesus was a prophet. People just changed around what he said. You know, that's our belief. So I was like, Buddha was a prophet. And Buddhist was like, nah, man, no, it's two different things. Like, we don't believe in heaven and hell. Buddha didn't teach that. I'd be like, he didn't? 
So Noble Drew Ali was just like, he was a good person. He was a prophet. So I'm saying we still be, are affected by some of these people's teachings. We think that it's, you know, like it's not, you're not going to look at some 800-year-old book and it's going to say Buddha was a prophet. You know what I'm saying? It, you know, that's a picture of the Seven Circle Quran. So who is James Lomax Bay? James Lomax Bay, he was born in South Carolina in the 18, end of the 1800s. He was born three years after the end of slavery in South Carolina, right? He joins the Moore Science Temple. He becomes the head of the Moore Science, second in charge, but he becomes the head of the Detroit Temple. The Detroit Temple, at this time, Detroit has one of the strongest economies in the United States. So they start rolling in money in the Detroit Temple, but they send it in all to Chicago. So more Science Temple's head, where Noble Drew Ali was, was Chicago. The second biggest temple was Detroit. But at the time in Detroit, they got Arabs in Detroit. They got Ahmadiyya in Detroit. They had one Sudanese man. This one Sudanese man, he was he was he wasn't down with you know how like nowadays Muslims get so beat up. We just like man, we just need unity. He wasn't on that tip. He was like more science templeism and Ahmadiyyaism is going to lead you to hell. So he starts talking to James Lomax Bay. Like Bay is like X for the nation Islam, right? Which is funny because Bay is actually a letter in Urdu, like X and L. So the other letter that the 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 Nate the more scientific they would use L, so you'd either be L or Bay. I'm just pointing out the similarities because every time I get this talk, people from the nation get up, or people not they're not in the nation, but at one point they was in the nation. They get upset with me. Say, man, Elijah Muhammad didn't know nothing, and then he met. It. I'm like, no, man, Elijah Muhammad was in the more science temple. The head temple for the nation this time was in Detroit. That number two temple was in Chicago. It was exact reverse for because James O. Max Bay was the head guy and then he becomes a Sunni Muslim. But the main reason he became a Sunni Muslim was because I mean, Noble Drew Ali, he started doing a womanizing thing. So very similar to Elijah Muhammad is the reason why Malcolm X left the group. But they didn't, one day they read something in the Quran and said, this ain't matching up. It was the character. They was like, your character, you womanizing. And yet at the same time, you're telling me that you divine. So James Omax Bay he leaves the group. He establishes the first Mohammedan church. He had never heard the term mosque. He's like, we got the first Mohammedan church in the world or in Detroit. And I kind of jumped ahead. So one, this right here, this is the governor's inauguration for Illinois, right? Noble Drew Ali gets invited to the governor's inauguration. This is how big that group was. Like the, the governor was like, oh, these guys could deliver votes. 
Like when I was coming up, the Muslims didn't deliver no votes. But them guys who preceded us, they got the first black alderman from Chicago elected to a congressional seat. And they was, I mean, they was Muslims for that. Historically, they was the Muslims. Religiously, I'm not saying like their Aqida was Islamic. But I'm saying, historically speaking, these people was the Muslims. When people saw them, they said, these people are Muslims. And they getting votes for us. They bringing in a lot of money. They're buying property. They're organized. In the 20s. In the 20s. This is like an amazing thing because Muslims don't, they, we can't organize today. <laughs> Nowadays, be like, organize? Organize religion? What you talking about? So in 1929, one of the main people, Claude Green Bay and James Lomax Bay, they team up and they split. They said, we're not going with the more science temple no more. We're going to just start practicing Islam. So Clyde Green Bay gets murdered because, you know, they was a black group. They was a Muslim group. They was a black group. So when black groups split, it's not pretty. <laughs> so they split. J. Clyde Green Bay gets murdered. Noble Drew Ali goes to jail for the killing and then dies two weeks later. Mysteriously in jail, just boom, dropped dead. Then he got this giant movement and the leader gone. So, and then what happens to James O. Max Bay? James O. Max Bay moves to Turkey because he was like, y'all not shoot me around this camp. So when he gets to Turkey, you know, he had been hearing from the Sudanese shape about the Ottoman Empire and all of that stuff. By the time he get there, all that stuff is done. They got this guy, Kamal Ataturk. So he goes to Kamal Ataturk. He says, man, I got all of these followers that are Muslim in America, man, if you give us farmland, we'll move here and practice Islam in peace. Kamal Ataturk was like, I don't even want no Muslims here from Turkey. Like, I'm a secularist. He said, but what I can do is I can give you a job digging ditches. So at the time, Turkey was trying to modernize. They don't want to be like an imperial type country with just a bunch of like fiefdoms. They wanted to be a modern place. So James Lomax Bay gets there with all of these black people. He like, they like, hey, just like y'all built America, y'all could build Istanbul. This is actually an article in the Associated Press that says Negroes find promised land in Turkey and end up digging ditches. Like, who knew? Like, you know, everybody loves to go to Turkey now. Next time you go to Turkey, be like, this road right here <laughs> was built Black History Month. Go to Turkey. We should have a February. <laughs> Trip to Turkey. Can we can we organize that? We'd be like that bridge right there was built by Negroes. <laughs> so all of his followers after they was dead, they said, "Man, we could dig ditches in America." Man, you sold us this pipe dream about religion and everybody going to accept us, and we all won. Yeah, everybody, every black Muslim know about that. So they just all left. 
So, man, we're going back to America, man. Call us when you get this right. So he moves to Egypt, 1931. Now he's just by himself, though. Everybody else left. He started out this big group. They dug ditches. Now he's by himself. He changes his name to Muhammad Izzadi. And he's put up. You know how we got to change the name to the CA in America? Young organization no more. But at the time, in the Muslim world, we had something called the Young Men's Muslim Association. So they're going to change their name to the Y, and we all going to get... But they put him up. They said, they said, wait, you from America? And you want to come here and learn Islam? At the time, in the Muslim world, the elite people from the Muslim world was going to the West... To learn engineering or something. Nobody had ever did the other way. You think of all of the Muslims from America that studied overseas? He was the first one. And like in 1931 in Egypt, you had to learn some serious Arabic. It wasn't, you weren't going to be just walking down Cairo and running to the dude that used to live in New York. Like everybody there ain't never been to New York, and they all speak Arabic. The only people who know English is like some elite Egyptians. They're not about to be hanging out with you. You just got through digging ditches. So he studies, and he takes the name. There's a Muhammad Izzedin from El Azhar, a big scholar and so he took the name of this big scholar like an honorific thing because he really looked up to him and he studies hadith sciences quran you know what i'm saying it's like a like a scholar like in 1936 comes back to america he starts something called edin Allahi. Universal Arabic Association. Most people never heard of this group. This group is the reason why when you go to a masjid in Oakland, we all wearing hoodies. But when you go to a masjid in New York, I'm talking about in the African, everybody wearing a thobe. Or everybody wearing a kufi some hired some flooding pants. That all came from this group. They was on some other stuff. So, like we said, Islam, part of Islam for black people was a quest for identity. I ain't a Negro, man. I'm not colored. I ain't a ninja. So what are you? I'm a Moor. I'm, a, I'm Asiatic. I'm this, I'm that. But he had studied Islam and Arabic. So he was like, when he came back to America, he'd tell all of the, the black people, at this time, you had thousands of Muslims. Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, Philadelphia, Cleveland, Ohio, Newark, New Jersey, because the seeds had been laid for years. But they never met nobody like him who actually spoke Arabic. So he comes back and he was in the leadership of the old movement. So when he came back, it was like prodigal son returns, but not prodigal. Like when we've been waiting for somebody like this, so they say, man, what is we, man? We Negroes. What you think he said that they were? What you say? Bilali? No, he didn't say Bilali. <laughs> Which is another term black Muslims came with. We Bilalians, man. No. He said, man, we Sudanese. We Sudani. Who knows what the word Sudan means? Sudan is the plural of Saudah, Saud, Saudah, 
means it's a feminine for S word. S word is masculine, means black. Sauda means like a black woman. But it was really the term that they used for Africa. So when they would say Balad Sudan, that meant Africa. But most of the people are black. Everybody ain't black there. Got some Algerians in the house. But most of the people, most of most people were black there, so they called it Balad Sudan. So here you have somebody in the 1930s telling black people, tell people you Sudanese. That's amazing, man. And he opened up like he he started a curriculum that he would teach at Dean Alahi, and it taught it emphasized the Arabic language. When he would give any khutbah, he would never give it in English. The e khutbahs. You know, like even in America, we give a cook bars in English all day. We gonna get that like, and then we just hum the little But he was like, hey, we ain't even speaking in British dollars always wrestled with. So what is the cook bar? Can't pray in English. Don't count. So he, in the 1930s, he's having e prayers. And he's speaking Arabic. And so when the people like, man, it's making, it's pushing people to learn the Arabic language. Because if you're going to go and all the talks going to be in Arabic, you're going to be like, man, I need to learn some Arabic. He opened up a bunch of communities, like 15 different ones. These was like the first time in America because but prior to him in places where they had Muslims like New York City, a lot of times they would do Juma on Sunday because they was like, man, we got work Friday. When we just do Juma on Sunday. But he was like, he don't even speak English in the goodbye. You know he ain't doing Juma on Sunday. He was like, and people like, so if I was to tell you that there was a group that claimed to be Muslim, they said they had a prophet. That prophet was a womanizer. Then the second in charge, the number two guy, went to the Muslim world and came back Muslim, who would I be talking about? Malcolm X, right? Because he was Malcolm X before Malcolm X. Because the, only, the difference is Malcolm X was killed so fast when he came back that he wasn't ever able to establish a movement. You know, it's like chapter 2 or chapter whatever 25 and that was it all the other chapters how I got to Islam the Islam 4 that wasn't in there James Lomax Bay got a lot of people who followed him man look at this they wearing like thobes in like the 30s his movement spread through the mid-Atlantic states. So they didn't call, he didn't call his places masters, he called them units. So he had, a, they founded them in Hamilton, Whitesboro, Newark, New Jersey, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, Cleveland, Columbus, Buffalo was the biggest one. They bought a farming community in Buffalo, they called it Jabal Arabia. And it's still there to this day. It was formed in the 30s. It's still there to this day. I met one of the young brothers from that community, African-American brothers, fluent in Arabic. I was like, man, come to the lighthouse, man. You're going to be all right, man. Like, you ain't never been overseas. You fluent in Arabic. 
He said, yeah, man, you know, my granddad, this guy I talked about a little bit earlier. He was the guy who started out uh, uh, Ahmadiyya, and then he became Sunni Muslim. He wrote the book, Arabic Made Easy. In 1943, they formed an organization, his group of people who used to be in the Moore Science Temple, along with the group of people who used to be more uh, Ahmadiyyas, they formed a group called Uniting Islamic Societies of America. I think we're going to break for prayer, and then we're going to come back, inshallah. Inshallah. Just when it's getting good. <laughs> Salaam alaikum. All right, son, we're going to leave it at the high point, inshallah. And, uh, <laughs> Bismillah. Wa salat wa salam ala Rasulullah. So we just wanted to finish up with the presentation. Um, so uh, Muhammad Izzedine, along with Wali Akram, they founded something called the United Islamic Societies of America. And they did that in 1943. So this predates Isna, Ikna, MSA West. <laughs> like what the groups we traditionally think about when we think about Islamic groups in America, this group actually predated it. And the thing is that it was like a merging of the Shafi'i and the Hanafi Madhab. Because all of the Ahmadiyya people, people who was Ahmadiyya who came into Islam, they were Hanafi. And, you know, Muhammad is a dean. He studied in Egypt, which is like the only Shafi'i, like they, every place else in Africa, nine times out of ten, they're going to be Maliki. But the Egyptians, they Shafi'is. So you had that going on. And then you had, you know, anybody who's familiar with the Ahmadiyyas, they are like very patriotic, right? So when they was in India, they supported the British. Like they did, they they're not like very revolutionary. And that's why they was funded by the British because their outlook they didn't, they, they, were, they, they was the first ones to say jihad al-nafs, jihad al-akbar, and those kind of things. This is spiritual jihad, you know what I'm saying? And this was at the time when the British had colonized India, so the British, they loved the Ahmadi movement. And that's why so many Ahmadiyya were given asylum and able to come to America because they was super patriotic. Whereas coming from the more science temple background, the uh, the AAUAA, they were all about social justice and stuff. So you had them kind of two conflicting understandings of Islam and that led to the group they came up at one, they drafted a Muslim 10 year plan in 1943, they wasn't around in 1953 to see if the plan made it. Like, we always want to outlive our plans, y'all. Like, if we build an institution, we want it to be here for our great-grandkid. We want MCC to be around. We don't want to argue and fight and then the, everything just falls apart. You know, but so because they had like different outlooks, one was like, no, man, go ahead and join the, the military or something. And the other one was like, nah, man, we talking about freedom of our people. So they, you know, they, they fell into conflict. But this is them. And if you was, if we was to zoom in, you would see. You know, what Muslims don't understand is at this time, 
1943, the Nation of Islam had less than 500 members nationwide. And these Sunni Muslim groups were in the thousands. And most people would think it was the opposite. But these groups, they was Muslims in the 40s. But because people start to age out. So if you doing something and you don't, you don't have a transgenerational plan, you just going to get older and older. People are like, dang, Sunday, are you still at the lighthouse? <laughs> you couldn't get nobody to come and do the goodbyes. You be like, hair starting to get gray. I got a gray. Somebody told me I had a gray hair. He said, man, that gray hair looks so cool. I said, what gray hair? I try to pluck that joint. Stock for a lot. <laughs> so he moved to Newark, New Jersey. And this this is what this is why the face of Islam in America became the nation of Islam. Because as he got older, you know, at one point he was probably seen like like how we see Mam Zaid. You know, he was he was an older statesman when he came back from studying overseas. So like most of the Muslims was younger than him. So they looked at him for like advice and he was he was able to teach Quran to members of the nation of Islam. Remember, he would tell the, the nation Islam leadership, look, look, you come a day of the week, just you and your ministers, and I'll teach you how to read Arabic language. And more science symbols. You pick a, any day of the week, it's you and your leadership, and I'll teach him how to read the Arabic, because in his mind, knowledge is power. You learn, you're going to become better. So he was able to teach all of these people who you get them in a room, a fight might break out. I'm talking about today. Today you put these different groups in a room, all you got to do is throw somebody from the Hebrew Israelites and they really going to be boxing. But he was able to say, so when, like, when you would see members of the Nation of Islam in New York City area, they weren't like members of the nation of Islam in like L.A. Like they could read Arabic. They had a deeper understanding. They just was more like, well, you know, the nation of Islam is this is good organization. So in 1957, he died. So when he was in Newark, he stepped on a rusty nail while building his house. This is when men was men. Like, they was like, we're going to go build a house. <laughs> Nowadays, we be like, how much you rent this place for? <laughs> they was like, we just going to buy an empty lot for $50 and build a house. But he stepped on a rusty now and he got, had, had both his legs amputated. Which means he stepped on a rusty nail and ignored it. Brothers... Y'all got to do y'all doctor visits, man. Because if you step on a rusty nail, they're not amputating your leg tomorrow. It's like I stepped on a rusty nail and I just kept on walking, wondering why this thing is not healing up. But I don't want to go to the doctor. I could just imagine this wife, Karima, was like, when you go to the doctor, the worst thing you want to do is not go to the doctor and get your leg amputated because then your wife going to be like, I told that dude. <laughs> Girl, you know I kept telling him to go to the doctor. <laughs> That's like the worst thing ever. Like, dang, man, I got to hear this. He probably told the doctor, you sure you got to cut these legs? 
because I don't even want to hear it from my wife. Know what I'm saying? And when he died, so many people came to his funeral. Sunni Muslims, members of the Nation of Islam, members of the Moor Science Temple, people who just was about social justice. They wasn't even Muslim. And this was in 1957. Coincidentally, Malcolm X came out of prison and joined the Nation of Islam in 1955. And that's when the Nation of Islam's numbers ballooned under Malcolm X. But before that, it was like four, five hundred people nationwide. So one of his students had a son named Imam Hisham Jabber. And Imam Hisham Jabber, so I remember when I, I moved to New Jersey from Oakland. And, you know, we was getting around seeing the different matches. I was a teenager going with my dad. And I remember some brothers, so I thought they was from Sudan. They said they was from Sudan. And they spoke Arabic. They was in Elizabeth, New Jersey. I was like, why y'all eat collard greens, though? Like, you be saying you from Sudan. <laughs> Why you eating mac and cheese for iftar? Like <laughs> in Sudan, they eat like full or something. You know what I'm saying? But I mean, y'all say y'all from Sudan. I didn't know that that was like a whole movement of Muslims in America that said they were Sudanese. That was like a thing. And so when Malcolm X, who his life was had so many parallels. To James Lomax Bay, Muhammad Izzedine's life, when he was assassinated, the Nation of Islam threatened, said if anybody has anything to do with his funeral, we but we blowing the place up. It's like bomb threats. So everybody was like, well, he not being buried here. He was buried in the church eventually. Or the, the service was in the church because Muslims was like, yeah, he made that hajj and everything, but I ain't about to take no bullet for bruh, bruh. So Hisham Jabber was an imam in Newark who was part of the Adina Lahi Arabic, Universal Arabic Association. So he called Betty Shabazz, said, what, how can I help? She said, I need somebody to help bury my, my husband. So he came from Newark, and he buried Malcolm X, gave him Janazza. And he wrote a book called I Buried Malcolm X. And this book, a new edition by his son, Muhammad Jabber, just put out a uh, because it, it was out of print for years. You would try to buy it on eBay or something. It would be like $10,000 because it's the only book printed. I, I like books, but come on. But now it's, it's been re-put out. I buried Malcolm X, and it has an edition that tells the history of Adina Alahi Universal Arabic Association. I would recommend everybody buy that book. That way you could compare. You could be like, Sonny, I didn't even know what he was talking about. But Hisham Jabber, one of his students was named Salahuddin Shakur. And Salahuddin Shakur had two sons that joined the Black Panther Party, Lumumba and Zaid Shakur. And he had a stepson who was named Matulu Shakur. So in 1973, they had this shootout on the New Jersey Turnpike. So a woman named Joanne Chesmar, she was injured and taken to prison. There was another man killed at the scene named Zay Shakur, whose father was a member of Adina Lahi, 
Universal Arabic Association. In 19, so 1973, they had a shootout. 1976, she's convicted of the murder, even though the, from the wounds she sustained, there's no way she could have shot anybody. Like, you know, obviously the state troopers started shooting because Zay was killed. She was almost killed, but she survived. And then there was a third person on the scene who fled, who killed the state trooper. So she wrote, she has a book. She changed her name to Asata Shakur. Asata is how in Hausa, the Hausa language, that's how they say Aisha, Asata. She was Muslim. She became Muslim in prison. She also had a baby in prison. She got a deep book, a deep life story. But in 1979, Matulu Shakur broke her out of prison. Matulu Shakur, who was raised by Salah Dean Shakur, he was he was Salahu Dean's stepson or something. Here and another brother named Seku Udinga and a couple of women broke her out of prison. From 1979 to 1985, she was living in America with like a $2 million price on her head. This is before hip-hop music. Now, because of hip-hop music, somebody would have collected that $2 million and went and bought some bubbly. Like when I was growing up, I didn't even know what Cristal and all of that stuff like hip hop music that made people so hedonistic in America. Everything was about, man, I'm going to feel good if I get enough money. That's what they feeding people. She was on the run and they was flooding the community with top 10 wanted posters for this woman. And people was putting posters up in their house they said, Asada is welcome here. For five years. And then she went to Cuba. She's still alive in Cuba to this day. Matula Shakur was the stepfather of Tupac Shakur. We talking about the legacy of Sheikh Mohammed Izzedine. Tupac Shakur used to live in Oakland. He knew Surah Fatiha. He grew up in a Muslim community in Jersey. Islam didn't start in America in the 70s. It didn't start with Elijah Muhammad. It didn't even start with Malcolm X. There's a beautiful history, but if we don't tap into it, we're going to miss out. We're going to be like Tupac Shakur. Came from a Muslim family. Like generationally Muslim, not my mama was a convert, like Saladin Shakur would have been his granddad. And these people was activists, man. They wasn't just sitting at home. And the people who put them signs in the window. They wasn't Muslim people. They was regular people. And they said, Asada Shakur, if she come here, she welcome. That is Izza from Allah. And that's what Islam in America is really about. If you show people you with them, they going to be with you. If you show people that you about to struggle, they going to struggle with you. 
So that's pretty much the story. Finn means the end. We got any questions about anything? We talked, we covered a lot. We went from like 1830 something <laughs> to when did Tupac die? 1996. That's a long time. That's a whole 20th century, basically. We got any questions about anything we talked about? Who knew about Tupac? She said, I did. Everybody, everybody like, man, come on, we from the lighthouse. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so the Shakur family, that was like a big Muslim family. You know what I'm saying? Like, you go to places and you find people like Wally Akram's family. It's so many of them in Cleveland. They all over the place. He opened up a mansion in the 20s, essentially, and it's still open to this day. Like, that's an amazing feat. That's an amazing feat. So some, some of the things that they... Some of the plans didn't come to fruition. You know what I'm saying? You know, the 10-year plan that they did in 1943, it didn't make it to 53. But a lot of the institutions that they built are still here. Even Malcolm X, like, you know, they have a, the Mosque of Islamic Brotherhood. That was his mosque. The thing they called it something else when he was alive. Muslim Inc., Muslim Mosque Incorporated. But they're still there, Mosque of Islamic Brotherhood. You know what I'm saying? Go there on Fridays and go to Juma. They still do programs. You know what I'm saying? It actually it was held together by his his sister. You know what I'm saying? So, you know, alhamdulillah. We got any questions? Everybody like, when are we getting the, the soul food? Soul food is on the truck. Mac and cheese, baked beans, brisket, tri-tip. Please don't miss out. Know what I'm saying? Halal soul food. Most time you go to a soul food place, you can't eat nothing up in that joint. You go to halal soul food place, you can eat everything. It's going to taste a little bit different. Like, this ain't like Granny's cooking. Granny used to use that sweet meat. I used to go to my grandmama's house. <laughs> She'd be like, baby, I made you some gumbo, too. It's right there. See, she made my gumbo with everybody else, but then she would take the pork out. <laughs> it's like, that's for you and your sisters right there. You eat that right there. I had to wait till she leave and throw that whole thing out loud or pour it back in the pot. I'm like, I already know. And I think that, yes. So I don't know any, she asked, do I know anything about Yasin Bey's lineage? Because his name, his last name Bey, which means that they definitely probably came from the Morris Science Temple. But every American Muslim group, this African American, came from the Moorish Science Temple. Like there's some kind of way that it tracks back to either the Moorish Science Temple or the Ahmadiyya movement. People be like, how can you say that? They'll mention a group, and I'll say, okay, well, this group started here, but then it's, at one point they was all named Bay. So his family, they probably was members of the Moore Science Temple. So, like, you find brothers now, you know, this, they, they're Muslim, but they, you know, they still, they going to be like, I'm a Moore, I'm not black. I mean, I think it's, she said, well, what's, if somebody was given the name black, I, I, I don't think we was given the name black, I think we ended up choosing that for ourselves. It was like not a time. I think black people was called a lot of other things. And at one point we was like, yelling loud. I'm black and I'm proud. So people was looking for an identity. So we was like, what are we going to be? I remember when I, I remember before. So there's like this clip of Malcolm X talking about Gaza or something, but they don't have him speaking. It's just like something you can hear. 
That's AI because Malcolm X never said African Americans. That wasn't a term. They used to say Afro American, and he barely ever said that. So that's some fake stuff. You know what I'm saying? Like Malcolm X loved Palestine. He he visited Gaza. We don't have to make stuff up though. But as to her question, if somebody want to say I'm a Moor, the good thing about being American, you can be whatever you want to be. This you could claim. You know, this, my pronoun is more. What they going to say? They going to say, you can't say that? Yes, hey, people say whatever. My pronoun is Asiatic, black man. I'm going to put that on my little signature on my email at work. Pronoun Asiatic, black man. <laughs> so when they took you talking about me, the third player said, please, guys, please say black man over there said. <laughs> but the funny thing is the first black person from Africa to come to they got this book called Cabeza de Vaca which for all of my Spanish speakers they say man you slaughtered that but what I was trying to say is the head of the cow, Cabeza de Vaca. It's a book that was written about this group of people who came to, they were Spanish settlers. They first, they started out in, uh, they was the first ones to come to North America. The Spanish, like Columbus and ship, all of them, they went to the Caribbean. But you had this one group they came to North America. They had a guy on that ship that was the translator for the Native American. Between he spoke Spanish and Arabic in some kind of way, he could translate with the Native Americans. They, it's a, it's a, it's a. You look this guy. Then the more, the more. Or he was also known as Esteban Nico, but his real name was Mustafa. I can't remember the last name, but he came here in the 1500s. He went to Texas, Americans put him in, but he ended up going to Texas. And then they, they made him like the main translator for the Spanish, gave him his freedom. And then he went away, he married a Native American woman, he disappeared. And when they would ask the Native American, what happened to Stephen Nico? The Native American was like, oh yeah, he died. I mean, eventually he died, but uh, you know, at one point he probably just said, I gotta get away from all these white people. So him and his wife, <laughs> I'm saying that to say he was a Moor, though. He was a Moor. Like, that's what he called himself. So sometimes people be like, there is no such thing as Moors. He's like, well, the first, first African-American was not called African-American. He's called Stephen Amore. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. It's time. It's time for questions and shots. Just raise your hand. I'll come over to the mic. And those that are watching online, you just type in the chat box and we'll get uh, most of the audience. Just raise your hand, sisters and brothers. Oh, uh, Sister Amelia, come on. All right. Wow. Looks like that question was so good. Oh, wow. I hear the hands go. Let me get the Dr. Friday first and I'll get you, sister. Just one more question. What do you think the landscape um, of America would look like um, had, had Malcolm X not been assassinated? What do you think? Because he was kind of reaching this crescendo, right? Um, you were saying that Malcolm X wouldn't have been assassinated? What do you think the landscape would look like now? I mean, I don't think it would have been too much difference. I feel like his book, so had he, I feel like the even in his assassination, he never really was killed. 
because his book was so important to so many people. So even if he was here, it would have had the same effect. He would have just had that same influence. So people who never met Malcolm X, they they weren't even born when he was born. Like it's kids that ain't even born today that's gonna be born in non-Muslim families, and they're gonna be like, Man, the reason I became to Islam was because of Malcolm X. And this is what Allah in the Holy Quran he says, Don't speak of those who die and his way is dead. They're not dead. You just can't perceive them. But you see their effect. The effect that they have still goes on. You know what I'm saying? So even though he's not physically with us, I can't see how him as a human being could have done much more in life as he did in death because he's been so important for so many people. Yes. Um, so, sorry. I feel like I'm too loud. Um, so I heard from people in the past that, you know, a lot of the time, you know, prophets, when they're described, they're described with um, a light complexion. When I heard that, I actually heard people say that it's actually false, that actually there was five prophets in Islam that were actually black. And one of them was Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. I was wondering if you could confirm that. And if, um, and because I did hear that they were from, and I could be wrong, but that the the first actual Arab people were actually black. So if you was to take the Meccan society, right? It's like, so the idea when we have, when we think of the Meccan society, because you said we saw the message, like when we see people who are Arabs today, most of those people, they descended from the Byzantine Romans. So in the time of the prophet, Syria, Lebanon, Palestine, that was whenever the prophet said Rome, that's the type of places he talked about, right? So every people were sent prophets, right? This is black people, Asians, white people, you no know, people down under. Every people had prophets, right? The Quran, Allah, when he revealed it, he revealed it as a very colorblind book. Because for Allah, the way we look doesn't really matter. It's what we do and what we believe. So when we read about Musa, Islam, in the Hadith, it says he was black. Even in the Quran, it says... His miracle was when he put his hand in his chest and comes out as white. That wouldn't have been a miracle if he was a white guy. <laughs> the Pharaoh would have been like, big deal. <laughs> right? And it, he, it's, it's, it comes out white without leprosy. Because when people would have leprosy, their skin would become pale. But it's saying his skin is not pale because of leprosy. It's a miracle. Showing that he was he was definitely Musa Islam was black. You know what I'm saying? But even even when you think about Mecca, so in Mecca, they they used to have this term called hygiene. Right? A hygiene meant a person was mixed with African blood. Be be like, well, big deal. A person from Africa could be white. No, when they so when so Bilal, when we hear Bilal, we think he was jet black, but he was actually hygiene because Rabah, his father, was Yemeni, and his mother was so dad. So dad meant African woman. It didn't mean she was necessarily black. I mean she was black. But it was Arabs who was black too, who weren't from Africa. They wouldn't have been called so that. They'd have been described as Adam, Shadid al Udman, very dark. So, and then, why am I saying this? Because in our mind, we think Bilal was being discriminated against because he was black and everybody else was white. But if you say, okay, look, the, a famous person, who was hygiene 
makes his dad was named Abdul Uzza. Abdul Uzza was Quraysh. He was a hundred percent Arab, and he married an African woman from the same tribe as Bilal's mother, which means she was so dead. She wasn't like from Morocco. And they had a child, and that child's name was Nufel Ibn Abdul Uzza. Nufel, the son of Abdul Uzza. So if his, if, if his father was from Ireland, which he wasn't, he was from Quraysh, but just say, if, if his father was from Ireland or something, Finland, with a super white, and his mama was African, he's 50% what we would call today black. He looked like Barack Obama, right? We see Barack Obama, we don't say, okay. But his father was Quraysh. He wasn't from Europe. Say, at Newfell. Mama was African. He marries an African woman. So he's 50% black. Son named Hudson. 75%. 50% black. He was black. And as black as Bilal. Both of them had mixed race. They was the same amount black. Nufel was the judge for the Quraysh. Whenever they would need a resolution, they would have Nufel ibn Abdul Uzza settle the dispute. He was their main judge. So does this look like people who just hate black people because they black? Because that's what they'll make us think when we go to Sunday school. They hated Bilal because he was black. Why they didn't hate Nufel then? Nufel loved black people so much he married a black woman. And they had a child who was 75% black named Khatab. And Khatab had a child, so Khatab is blacker than Bilal. Because Bilal is 50%. And I'm telling you what all the Islamic historians say about Bilal. It's not something I'm making up. He's 50% black. Khatab is 75% black. And Khatab was Quraysh. And Khatab had a son Named Umar. Umar ibn al Khattab's father was blacker than Bilal. And they want us to think that the Arabs hated people because they was black. It's not true. It's not true. Those are our hang-ups. That comes from white supremacy. The Arabs didn't trip off of skin color. They be like, well, why did they hate Bilal? Bilal's grandfather tried to destroy the Kaaba with an elephant. And Allah revealed a surah called Surah Tufil about this incident. The Prophet Muhammad was born in the year of the elephant. And all of the slaves that came into Mecca they came from this incident. There was no transatlantic slave trade. We got these black slaves picking cotton. That's what we put on it. Bilal's father, grandfather was named Abraham. And Abraham was a king who conquered the Arabian Peninsula. People wasn't, people looked at those, they looked at black people. It's in the language. The word aswad comes from the word sud. And sud means noble. In the Arabic language, the name for black in Arabic means, when you say somebody's name, Syed, 
Say it. This is from the same root. So you say say it means we say Sayyidina Muhammad. Our noble messenger, the prophet Muhammad. It comes from the same root as the word for black. But because we've been tricked by white supremacy, we look at history and we cherry pick. Bilal was a black slave. You know all them ninjas is slaves. Then why is Umar the greatest Sahaba? He's one of the greatest Sahaba and his dad was blacker than Bilal and nobody blinked. And you should ask, you just, when somebody's teaching about blackness in Islam, ask, how come we ain't talking about Umar today? Why are we talking about Bilal? He wasn't the only black dude. This is a historical fact that the second caliph, caliph of Islam was blacker than me. Because my dad ain't 75% black. My mom ain't 75% black. They lucky to be in the 30s. We've been over here for hundreds of years. We take a DNA test, they gonna be like, your family is from Europe. <laughs> so alhamdulillah, I'm sorry I went off a little bit, but we shouldn't, as Muslims, we shouldn't trip off of the color, color of people's skin and that's just what we have been taught because white supremacy teaches that black people have got to be lower. The darker you are, the lower you get. That's just, that's what, when, when people say that's a social construct, that's what they mean. So you would have went back to the time of the prophet or on the day of judgment when you see the Sahaba, you're going to be like, man, them cats look way more melanated then I think in my mind when I think it, I mean, you can see the world today. Most of the Muslims are melanated people. So where, how did they go from being all white people except for Bilal to the minority of people is white? Like it don't even make sense. Not saying that white people can't be Muslim, but just historically saying Islam goes from east to west from Mecca and those is all melanated places. Allah says he made or the Prophet says something said he made Allah made this 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 religion was spread to the east and the west most parts. He didn't say the northernmost parts. So alhamdulillah. <laughs> uh -huh. Mashallah. Great answer. All right, raise your hand, guys. Inshallah, Tabarakallah. Get all tired from all that. Alhamdulillah. You know, so. Oh, there we go. Uh, Assalamu alaikum. Thank you, uh, Sam. When you were describing the uh, Ahmadiyya, uh, there's a lot of parallels to the nation of Islam taking Elijah Muhammad as uh, the messenger as well. Is there like parallels with that? With inspired by Ahmadiyyas? I mean, so there's two schools of thought. So the question about the nation of Islam, you know, it's parallels to to the Ahmadiyya because, I, and it's really because you know the followers of the nation of Islam they split into two. So the most the what we knew as the nation of Islam, most of those people became Sunni Muslims. If you ask them about Elijah Muhammad. They're going to say he was a good man. He made Toba. You know what I'm saying? But they still love Elijah Muhammad. And then there's groups of the Ahmadiyya. They feel that about Ghulam Ahmed. And then there's groups of the Ahmadiyya that say, no, he's a prophet. And there's still groups. Who, when we think of the nation of Islam, you know, we think of the people who say Elijah Muhammad is still a messenger. So some people say that uh, Far Muhammad was actually uh, a Ahmadi. So there's a man who who's buried in Hayward, and he was the main teacher of Wallace Muhammad, and his name was Muhammad Abdullah. 
right? And so the rumor was that he was Fard Muhammad. And so if you believe that rumor, then they definitely, because he was an Ahmadiyya. You know what I'm saying? I don't believe that rumor because he immigrated to America in like the 50s. And the nation of Islam is from the 30s. I don't even think he's old enough to have been, you know, Far Muhammad. And Far Muhammad was also known as David Ford. You know what I'm saying? And Wally Ford. But he was never known as Muhammad Abdullah. He was known as, you know, Far Muhammad. So it depends if Muhammad Abdullah was Far Muhammad, then 100%. They come from each other, but it's more likely that because the Ahmadiyya were here, they might have just had indirect influence on the nation of Islam. And definitely the fact that a lot of the people who Elijah Muhammad would have teaching, they were Ahmadiyyas. Like his, like I said, his son's main teacher was an Ahmadi Muslim. But you know, the Prophet Sallallahu said that there would be forty. Antichrist, and each one of them will claim that they are messengers of God. You know what I'm saying? And so, you know, minor to minor Antichrist, they claim to be messengers of God. So it could, you know, like Ghulam Ahmed, Elijah Muhammad, they would just fall under this hadith. People who claim to be messengers of God, and then the Prophet some said, but there is no messenger after him. And Allah knows best. All right. I think we're going to call it a night, Shalom. Yeah, we're going yeah. to call it a night. Yeah, let's do it, Shalom. Please don't forget the food truck. That food is good. You know what I'm saying? You know what I'm saying? That he actually catered a couple of our events before. It's good food. It's a good price. It's a lot of it. You know what I'm saying? Alhamdulillah. So we should we close with Surah Asr? Let's please. Let's close with Surah Asr, inshallah. Audu bila minish shaitan and rajim. Bismillah rahman rahim Wal Asr. Inna in sana la fikus. Illa ladina amanu wa amilu salihat. With the wasa of the haq, with the wasa of the sab. And, uh, you know, Kari, um, Kari Omar, when I was young, he used to lead to Hajjid. At one of the massages in Oakland. And he would do in the last 10 nights, he would complete the Quran into Hajjah prayer. He would do three Jews a night. Man, I just did it one. I didn't know what I was in store for. I said, wait a minute, man. <laughs> I had never, I, had, I was like, I was probably a teenager. I said, like, I ain't never heard this much Quran being recited. So alhamdulillah, and that's what I'm saying. Like he's still coming to the masjid, still doing his thing. So it's like the institutions are important because that's how we that's how we're able to live our religious life. You can't really really we found that out in the pandemic. People were saying it's so hard to be Muslim by myself. You know what I'm saying? It's hard to get up and pray by yourself. You know what I'm saying? So please support MCC. They crank out so many who follow the Quran. Kari Umar teaches so many people the Quran. So many kids grow up knowing the whole Quran. So please support the masses. You can see, you know, some masses you can just come to and see all the work where your money's going. It's going ever. It's always a project. So inshallah, please support MCC. If you're online still, I don't know if they cut me off. Please support MCC. Bismillah. <laughs>